Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's computer, they don't have a computer rig in blue. Woo-hoo. Oh, so it's fine now. Okay. I guess all we need to do is drop What was it? It wasn't set up right. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this presentation is called Smoke and Mirrors. It's going to be looking at security through obscurity. Um, you can actually move through. Uh, standard disclaimer, that this is not uh, reflective of the opinion. You know, what we're saying is not uh, official opinions by uh, Freaknik, SRA, which is a company we work for, or any other future or present bosses. So about us, um, my name is Adam Myers, this is Dan Van Bellingham. We're uh, security co- consultants. We work with the federal government mostly, um, doing all, all types of security assessments and pen testing and stuff like that. Uh, we're part of a penetration test team, or more to the point, we are the penetration test team. <laughs> um, uh, we're both CCE certified forensics people. We do security architecture, and we're both Buffalo Chicken Wing aficionados. Um, That's us. us. All right, so the agenda that we're going to go through is um, what we've entitled Smoke and Mirrors is really security through obscurity. And we're going to go through why security through obscurity is bad, and then we're going to go through why security through obscurity is good. Uh, We're going to talk about uh, crypto versus, like, the military intelligence uh, communities perspectives on obscurity Oops, sorry <laughs> um, we're going to talk about best practices and better practices and we're going to go through uh, what s and m <laughs> security uh, smoke and mirrors uh, can accomplish uh, protecting the network hiding assets things of that nature and then we're going to talk about how to implement it down to the code level in some instances um, and then some other techniques that kind of fit in so oops Stupid cable. Oh, there we go. Um, all right. So uh, Dan's going to go through uh, some of the different aspects here. All right, um, so I did a quick search, uh, security through obscurity, and right away things come up, you know, why it's bad. Uh, one of the things that popped up was an ROC by Steve Bellavin and, and, uh, and Bush um, a couple of years ago that went through a couple, you know, based on the premise that security through obscurity is, is bad. You don't want to try to hide um, vulnerabilities, it's really saying things that you want to keep um, discussions of vulnerabilities open. Um, by people discussing open um, vulnerabilities, it helps um, people come out with ways to prevent against those vulnerabilities and how to fix them. Um, so the whole idea of having things on the open open side is, is better. Um, a lot of the crypto we need really come across uh, based on things like Kir- Kirchhoff's law, is that you you really want your systems to be open. The only thing secret about a crypto system should be the key itself. Um, that way, all the crypto we need in the world can bang on the uh, bang on the algorithms, and then once they do that, um, they can all agree together that it is a secure algorithm. Um, by keeping things um, proprietary, um, then everyone kind of shouts out saying that that must be flawed because you're not telling us how the system really works. So that's um, why security through obscurity really gets kind of a bad bad rap is by saying it's really kind of based on the crypto school of thought that you want to keep your your architectures open um, and not not closed. <laughs> Adam said we uh, we do a lot of consulting for the federal government, DOD, some intel agencies. Um, in that type of community, security through obscurity is good. That's what what they're taught. You want to keep things secret. You want to keep your se- you want to have certain information that you have that you don't want your enemies to know. Um, in World War II, there's a big campaign: loose lips um, sink ships. Right? You didn't want people writing about where they were going, where they're being deployed. Uh, that type of information could could affect the soldiers and the military. Um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of our strengths in the mil- in World War II came from the fact that we were able to crack a lot of the code that was being sent around the world, um, and that gave us an advantage over our, our enemies. Um, it's also in the military; everything's based on the need to know what information um, uh, what information is out there. Certain people um, you, m- you may have a security clearance, but you may not have access to that information. So it's all based on need to know. So, so again, from this this perspective. Um, security through obscurity is, is a good thing. This is what people are taught. In, in the software engineering community, um, 
software code obfuscation is, is a common, um, common practice. Right? They try to do this to help prevent against reverse engineering. So there's, there's tools, utilities, there's even classes taught on how you obfuscate your code to help prevent against people um, reverse engineering and then taking your code away. There's even contests out there, uh, international obfuscated C code contest, or it's a parole contest. We have an, um, and here's an example. I think I pulled this one down off of, off of Wikipedia um, based on the last, I thought I'd just say that based on the last talk. Um, anyway, so this one comes up. There's, here's, this is the actual code that generates 12 verses of the 12, uh, 12 days of Christmas. Um, just to check it out, we ran it through, and uh, here's the output. So, but the code actually does work. So that's, this is common practice in the, in the software engineering community. So, so we're going to build on this, just some basic best practices for security. This is nothing new for most people here. Um, doing things like patch management, um, having strong passwords, good passwords, teaching people not to use things in the dictionary. Um, again, Adam and I do a lot of pen testing for the federal government. I think last summer we, we were able to break into two CIOs accounts, two federal CIO accounts, based on their, uh, based on their passwords. One was soccer. Um, anyway, good perimeter security, having uh, IDS, IPS, um, using good access controls. Um, educating your users is, uh, is key, and then being able to secure, uh, secure your configurations, having good configuration management, locking down un unnecessary services, stripping things out. These are all you know, kind of textbook best practices for, for security. Um, that builds into what we call even better practices. So doing things like honeypots, um, obfuscating web server application error messages, having um, Tuning your IDS uh, to, in, in ways that you can help strip out some of the false positives and, and false negatives. Um, going through and consolidating your logs across all your, all your devices, um, applications, even uh, network nodes. Um, doing good code reviews, limiting access to, uh, to scripts, uh, CGI and other, other scripts internally uh, developed. Again, um, most scripts and code that's developed internally isn't put through the same uh, um, isn't put through the same um, measures as it would be a uh, normal open source community. So things internally you really want to have uh, restricted access to. And then just doing uh, regular assessments. Things are uh, dynamic environments. All right, so uh, what can it do? I mean, we really haven't um, talked about what you're going to do with this stuff now. Using the smoke and mirror technique, um, you're going to obfuscate your network architecture. You're going to obfuscate your code. You're going to obf uh, obfuscate target services, so you, you want to get the attackers to reveal themselves without actually penetrating the network. Um, some of the best attackers can be fooled by this method, um, and what we're about to present is stuff that we've picked up in doing testing and, and doing security assessments, stuff that we found people are doing and has actually aided in um, their ability to protect themselves and defeated us in being able to find some of this stuff right off the bat. Um, script kiddies, probably won't catch on and probably won't even care um, if they find, you know, an IIS exploit and they think you're running IIS and the exploit doesn't work, chances are they're going to move on to the next target. Um, it's going to cut down on IDS alerts potentially uh, and hopefully lure malicious users into revealing themselves um, because they're going to be tricked into doing something that they wouldn't ordinarily do. Um, and it can cr increase the level of effort and time that an attacker is going to need to penetrate a system, while also lowering the time that it's going to take for a response team to actually respond to the incident, um, because th they're going to be able to go in for things that are definitely targeted attacks and just brush the rest of the bullshit away. Can I say that? <laughs> I just did. Um, all right, so basically the theory, um, kitties are going to use the path of least resistance. They're not going to go after a target that, that's more difficult for them to attack. They're going to go after something that they have an exploit for and they know they can get in. Um, any security mis measure at all can pretty much deter um, a lot of the script kitties that are out there on the net. Um, real attackers will probably attempt to um, limit their recon signature, and by limiting their recon signature, they're probably going to pick up a lot of this smoke and mirror uh, you know, servers that have been obfuscated and the, the services that have been obfuscated. Chances are, if they're doing any sort of um, differential scanning, they're going to need to use decoyed hosts, and it's going to take a long period of time. And you know that, that's going to limit the amount of time that they're going to have to do actual recon. 
Um, and generally, I mean, they're going to go after low-hanging fruit. So if there's something that looks clearly vulnerable, chances are they'll probably try and hit that. Um, all right, so basically the two things that we, we're going to be going into is uh, misdirection and sleight of hand. Now, this is all stuff that a lot of you are probably doing. It's probably not going to be anything earth-shattering to you, but it's kind of a good collection of things that you can do in order to better protect the network. Uh, things like changing open SSH to win SSH or make up some other, you know, you could use SSH commercial or something like that. Uh, changing send mail to exchange, Apache to IIS or WebSphere or something along those lines. Um, moving Oracle's port, you know, changing the Oracle port to look like a SQL port is going to change of, uh, you're going to see a change in what people are trying to do to this, the system and really you shouldn't have that out on a, <laughs> on a networked, uh, a routable IP anyway. Um, and then sleight of hand, uh, open services associated with the vulnerability um, and run NetCat on them so that you can kind of try and trick people into running an exploit on a what they think is a vulnerable service. Uh, routes to nowhere, uh, kind of like you know, using things like LaBrea Tar Pit to really bog down a, an attacker. And then uh, everybody in here heard of Port Sentry? Uh, it's, it's really cool Perl scripts that... Um, Basically, they, they open up a port, and when an attacker tries to hit that port, it uh, black roots them. What's that? N uh, no, it's from Psionic, or PS Psionic. I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, it's free to download, open source. They also have Host Sentry, which runs on the host, and a Log Sentry, which does some sort of log consolidation. Um, so now that w when you start implementing these things, you're going to have... Um, to take other things into effect, uh, uh, take them into consideration, things like your IDS. Um, so some of the things you can do once you've implemented some of these obfuscation techniques is going to be ignoring irrelevant attacks entirely. So if you know that you're running a patching, you can pretty much stop looking at IIS attacks. Um, that's not something we'd recommend because um, w the way that we consider it is that ISS attacks now take on a new classification in that it's somebody that fell for it and they're going for this, this IIS server that's actually really Apache, but you've changed the header. Um, it, it's basically um, a, a good way to obfuscate that. Uh, watch for repeated attempts to attack a network. Um, you can create high-priority alerts for valid services. So you can, kind of what we're saying about giving it a new classification, you can give a new priority to some of these attacks that probably don't have anything to do with you, but it'll show you that somebody's actually taking the time to do recon they, they think they know what you're running, and now they're attacking it. Um, it can, uh, you can correlate recon and attacks without exposing services to the attacker, so that clearly if they think that you have SQL running and they go after it, um, you know that they've actually done some homework and they saw where it is. Oh, and if anybody has any questions while we're doing this, just feel free to raise your hand. Um, so network service SNM, we've got a quality picture of Monty Burns up there. Um, so we're going to go through some of the different services that um, you might be running, stuff like Apache, um, IIS, SSH. Uh, okay, yeah, you probably don't need to go through that anymore. Um, so real simple example is URL scan. It's free to download, provided by Microsoft. Um, you can do things like change the 404 errors. You can change the server identification strings. You can, um, th there's all kinds of different permissions that can be set on it. Um, it's simple, it's free, and it's effective. And if you happen to be running IIS, this is a, a great way to do this. Is Microsoft really distributing a package that makes their servers look like Unix servers? Well, it supports doing that. Um, all right, uh, with Apache, same, you can do the same stuff with Apache. You can do um, change error messages. You want to change your 404, your 502s, stuff to obfuscate what version of Apache you're running, or even that you're running Apache if you want. Um, change the banner to report IIS. Uh, another cool technique is grabbing some of the, uh, the, the error pages from IIS and throwing it into the Apache errors, and that way you can kind of really convince somebody that you're running IIS. Um, so here's a Apache server example. Um, and this is, a, I probably should have put the file name here. This is a file um, from the source code, and in it it defines the um, the Apache server, base vendor, uh, base product, major revision, all this stuff. So by simply changing this to be like micro, oh, better up there. 
um, changing it to Microsoft IS50 and then a build level like 2193, um, doing an MAP scan, a version scan against this, you're going to actually see it come back um, as IIS Web Server 5.0. And that, um, th that's typically resulting from a banner grab. And an attacker sees that, obviously, they're going to think that you're running Microsoft and maybe try and do some front page attacks or something like that against your system. Um, uh, another suggestion to kind of obfuscate this, uh, using something like Simple Secure Web Server, if an attacker hits that, they'll kind of come to the conclusion that you're probably running uh, Raptor Firewall uh, version 6.5 or, or lower, tricking them into thinking that there's an application firewall, potentially you're going to see um, Raptor-specific attacks. And then an IDS alert obviously triggering that was something that you can look for very easily. Um, so changing it to a vulnerable Apache or IIS, if you want to get a specific exploit, um, as an IDS alert, if you you know if you have a vulnerable version, and you see an attacker use a readily available script, then it's pretty easy to see who's trying to attack you and not put yourself at risk. Um, and it's always a good idea to spoof another product up because you know a lot of stuff like Metasploit, which has um, it, it can it's, it support multiple versions, shellcode for multiple versions. Um, they might get lucky and you might get owned. So. <laughs> So I wouldn't recommend just changing the version number. Um, here's a copy of OpenSSH. There's a, I think it was version.c. Just has a couple of definitions in it. So you can change that to whatever you want. Um, and once you compile, and for a lot of the stuff, you definitely want to <laughs> compile from source anyway. So once you've, you compile it in, it's going to actually build that as the banner and the, the fingerprint. Um, so if you scan through. Now, because there's no actual Win SSH service, it comes up as unidentified, but it actually, you could see that it comes through as Win SSH right there. So an attacker might think this is a proprietary SSH implementation or just really be confused. Um, so, I mean, this is a, a Linux box right now that, or BSD box that's running, you know, Microsoft IIS server. And you know, changing the postfix, I, I set it to postfix. But if you change that to Exchange, you can pretty much convince somebody that this is a Microsoft server. Um, here's the postfix um, version file. Again, it's kind of getting redundant, but all of these things have version files, and you just go in simply and change the version file um, with something like IIS or some of the um, binary executable products, you kind of need to use a, a hex editor and try and track this stuff down inside of it. A couple of uh, search scripts should be pretty easy to find where the version number is. And if you change the version number, just be careful that sometimes you need to have the exact same amount of characters for the server to run. And uh, WooFTP, there's actually a, a shell script in that called newvers.sh, and what it attempts to do is to um, put the build time into the compiled executable so that you know when it was built. Uh, you can change this to do whatever you want, and if you drop the percent %d um, with, the, uh, uh, with the time stamp, you can actually just drop all that, and you can make it look like uh, Microsoft IIS FTP. Um, so now that we kind of talked about some of the different uh, services that you can change. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about protocol smoke and mirrors, um, things that you can do at the protocol level to obfuscate what systems you're using and, um, in the case of ICMP, where you're located. Uh, you can change the time zone or you can, change, you, know, you can change it to a different time zone or you can change it to UTC. Um, you know, there's different reasons for each. Uh, changing the time zone you know, you could convince people that you're in one time zone and then as attacks start coming in for that time zone, if they're attacking at night, it'll actually be in the middle of your day and you have a full staff watching the IDS. Uh, for TCP, stuff like randomizing the ISN, um, w which comes out of the kernel, uh, proxy traffic to change the TCP fingerprints um, th that people are using. Like if anybody is using, like, POF, if you're familiar with that, uh, that actually does... Um, client-side uh, fingerprinting, so you can 
filter all your traffic through a proxy and change the TCP stamps and and kind of make somebody think you're using a different firewall or something of that nature. Um, and then breaking RFC compliance is definitely an issue you want to be aware of if you start messing with the TCP stacks or you start um, actually going in and changing stuff in the kernel code-wise. Um, databases, uh, same thing. Uh, obfuscating the port. You can go, you know, Oracle 1521, move it to 1433. Chances are people are going to start thinking that you're running SQL versus Oracle. Uh, setting up fake SIDs. If you set up SIDs that are uh, usually associated with things like PeopleSoft, an attacker might be going after a PeopleSoft um, implementation vulnerability or something of that nature, while they're missing that there's actually a SID for whatever it is that the database is doing. Um, so stuff like that, going to trick people. Changing the application headers, a little bit more difficult, especially when you start dealing with the Oracle and, and SQL, but um, still potentially possible. Has anybody had any experience with that? Nope. Okay. Um, yeah, well, another thing you can do is try to um, have ambiguous usernames, um, making it more difficult for attackers to learn about the organization. Um, you know, scrolling through through news groups or other things on, online, trying to find how, how user accounts are set up to get more uh, information about, about a target um, is one way. So instead of just having uh, J. Smith, if that's a typical username convention, J. Smith, um, you, you may want to mask that as, as Joe.Smith or Smith J or even something really ambiguous like um, J and some, some random number string. Um, using uh, email gateways allows you to do aliasing. That's one way. So if you are using individual email accounts, you can, um, before they come out of the gateway, you can change all the uh, username conventions to something standard so everything looks like it comes out with one, one standard um, e email name convention versus how you have the user account set up on your systems. Okay. And, uh, um, other thing, on the host level itself, you can um, try, try to change log file names and where they're, loca where they're located. Um, not keeping things in the, in the default location is one way to do that. Um, you know, changing your default admin accounts, um, you know, changing things around from root uh, or guest. Um, uh, chatter, chatter plus i files. Um, by changing the different uh, immutable flags, you can help uh, keep the integrity of your system valid until uh, someone really wants to change that file. Um, even having this I, def I was on a system where I had been the admin, and I had set the uh, the shadow and the password files. I set the immutable flag using Chatter, and like a month later, the person who actually got root after I stopped using that system called me up, and they were like, "What the hell did you do? We can't actually access the password file." So stuff like that will confuse attackers. That if they get in, you can actually kind of throw them off, and they might be like, "Well, I have super user privileges. Why can't I write to the file?" So that's a good way to kind of trick people up a little bit. Um, you, you can do s strange things to your file structure, um, having directories that don't really lead anywhere. And then uh, even on your production systems, we like to do things like just go through and remove all the command line interpreters from the system um, and the compilers. So if people do you know, get onto the system, they're limited to what they can really do with that. Another things we can do, like simple things with Wi-Fi, having mis uh, misleading SIDs there. You really want to have am ambiguous names. And we see a lot of people setting things up um, in D.C. with the name of the organization, um, even things like Bank of America on their, uh, on their SIDs. That's, you know, that's typically a bad thing. Um, you know, decreasing the, the beacon rate, another, another thing, or even putting up decoy access points is another way to obfuscate, um, your, ac um, obfuscate your, your wireless presence. Um, I think it was... Republican National Convention did that, where they had a kind of blanket statement saying we we're going to have any wireless at our convention. Um, but what they did do is they put up decoy APs to see who was actually trying to get on the wireless network so they could go and uh, tell them to stop. Um, it, with dial-up, you can do the same type of techniques with, uh, with banner changing, you know, taking the version numbers off, um, maybe not putting the name of the organization on the banner when it comes up. Uh, Another thing to do is do open source intelligence on yourself and your organization, going through looking at find out what, what's on Google, what are people posting about you. Um, we're able to a lot when we do our, our testing on different government agencies, we're able to pull a lot of information about the agency before we even get there. A couple of years ago, we were doing some work for EPA, 
and we were able to find information from different vendors that had done success stories about the EPA and their new data center. So before we even walked into their data center in North Carolina, we knew that they were running IBM mainframes, we knew they were running DEC Unix, we knew they were running Oracle, um, Oracle databases all in the back end. We had a lot of information about the organization even before we walked in, um, just from what people were saying about them on, on, uh, um, and what's being posted on the internet. So it's good to, good to go through and, uh, and, and do searches for, for yourself on a frequent basis. Um, people are posting things uh, all the time that, that changes. So even if you uh, do this, you know, one, one quarter, you may want to do it the next quarter, um, maybe even, even monthly. Oh, and then uh, stuff like Google Hacks. Everybody's seen that Google search where you search for the, the string from the webcam, and then you just start pulling back webcams um, just straight through Google. Even if they're not listed, it's just an IP address. It'll have the webcam there. Um, stuff like that you want to try and obfuscate as well if, you, if it's possible and you happen to need a webcam that's on a routable IP address. Um, so essentially wrapping it up, though, Security equipment is really expensive. IDS, really expensive. These things cost upwards of, you know, $50,000. Most of us can't afford that. Doing this type of technique, it's free. It's really easy to do. Um, there's really no maintenance once you've done it. And most of the tools needed to implement it are already there, so you might as well use them. Um, one of the things that we wanted to kind of open up to the general public is we're going to start trying to collect good obfuscation techniques so if anybody has good obfuscation techniques that they're already using, you want to kind of, we're going to try and open up like an open forum for getting the best, like an industry best practices for obfuscation. So uh, feel free to contact us as far as any good techniques that you might have. And then um, I think that's almost it. Um, also, if anybody's looking for a job, <laughs> we're uh, we're always looking for good qualified pen testers and code reviewers and stuff like that. Um, so if you are clearable, uh, you know, feel free to come talk to us offline or whatever. We'll be wandering around the convention for the next couple of hours at least. Um, and then questions, answers. Anybody have any comments, stuff they want to talk about? All right then. <laughs> The, is there a danger in, in, in this becoming so commonplace that everybody knows it? Um, not really, because then they still have to figure out wh what you really have going on behind the scenes. And then you could start doing, you know, the opposite will soon become true, that if you don't, it, it'll help protect other people, because if they don't do it, an attacker might assume that they are doing it, and then, you know, go to great lengths to figure out, try and figure out, you know, I know it's not Apache, it can't be Apache, and then all of a sudden, it turns out that it really is Apache. So you kind of, th th I think that there would be more of a movement towards security um, as a whole, and that other people would be uh, subject to some of the benefits of, of a mass obfuscation across the Internet. Okay. Um, well, thanks. <laughs>